This Week on Waterways. Establishing a new research natural area in the Tortugas. And buoy maintenance in the marine sanctuary. The Dry Tortugas, located 70 miles west of Key West, is a collection of seven small islands dominated by massive Fort Jefferson. But Dry Tortugas National Park is more than little islands and a big fort. It's a predominantly marine park, home to seagrass beds and beautiful coral reefs. Over 99.8% of the park's 100 square mile area, in fact, is marine. This ecosystem is considered a rich nursery ground for fish and shellfish and a world-class diving destination. The things that impressed me most uh, about the Dry Tortugas is the, uh, the beauty of the, uh, of the marine ecosystem, uh, the reefs uh, that are there, the abundance of the, of the fish species, and the remoteness of the area that's out there, uh, the uh, almost near wilderness qualities. For years, few people knew of the park's magic, but that is changing. As the park's popularity has increased into the new millennium, threats to its pristine qualities have become greater. In recognizing these threats, the National Park Service has designated a significant part of the park as off-limits to fishing and anchoring, within a zone called the Research Natural Area. In 1994, 23,000 people visited the Dry Tortugas. By 2000, that number had more than quadrupled to 95,000. And this may be just the beginning. Over the past few decades, scientists with various government agencies and educational institutions have conducted underwater counts of fish species. Their conclusion? Greater effort is needed to catch certain species, such as gray snapper, and many species are being overfished. This conclusion is based in part on the declining percentage of fish which have reached reproductive age. When we started to really look uh, at the resources and the condition of the resources in the park, we realized that the aquatic resources in the park, particularly fisheries and, and the coral, were, in, uh, were, were very much degraded. And particularly with fish, this, we, had, we recognized very quickly that we had a problem with the size and abundance of fish. And given the charge we had for protecting the park, we looked at a number of management measures that we could take to, uh, while providing for visitor enjoyment, we could protect the uh, uh, this uh, pristine resource. There's results uh, showing that the spawning indices uh, have dropped uh, below a level that the state and federal agencies consider um, as, as an overfish situation. That's, that's across the, the main fish populations, the groupers, the snappers, the, the grunts. So that was something that we were concerned about because our, the legislation that was passed in 1992 that established Dry Tortugas National Park, one of the mandates was to manage the ecosystem, the marine ecosystem, the wildlife and the fish populations in a near pristine condition. And uh, as when it comes to the fishery, uh, we were already below that. Another serious concern is the declining health of corals. In Dry Tortugas National Park, two species of branching coral, staghorn and elkhorn, have declined significantly. About 99% of staghorn coral reefs in the park have died. The diminished health of coral reefs isn't restricted to the Dry Tortugas. It's a global problem. The cause of their decline likely stems from a combination of stressors. These include local impacts such as anchor damage, regional problems like degraded water quality, and global issues like increased coral bleaching due to climate change. The National Park Service and other agencies believe that we must do everything within our control to minimize further damage to the region's surviving corals. 
What is to be done about these threats? Who is responsible for maintaining a balance so that the Tortugas ecosystem can be better protected? The Tortugas region is huge and extends well beyond the boundaries of the national park. Two government agencies are tasked with the management of the Tortugas coral reef ecosystem, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the National Park Service. When it became evident that the resource was threatened, both agencies needed to act. In an effort to curb the degradation, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary established the Tortugas Ecological Reserve in 2001. The new rule for this area, which covers 151 square nautical miles, is simple. Do not touch. No anchors on the bottom, no catching of lobsters or shrimp, no fishing. And then they watched. The marine sanctuary monitored the effects of their efforts. It soon became evident that the Tortugas Ecological Reserve was succeeding. More fish, bigger fish. But even this large protected area had its limits. The Tortugas 2000 Working Group, charged with identifying areas in the region deserving of no-take status, recognized that shallow water areas needed protection too. Such habitat, which serves as vital nursery grounds for many species, can be found within the boundaries of Dry Tortugas National Park. Enter the National Park Service. Effective January 19, 2007, approximately 46 square miles of Dry Tortugas National Park was declared off-limits to fishing and eventually to anchoring. Called the Research Natural Area, or RNA for short, this area is considered a necessary complement to the 151 square mile Tortugas Ecological Reserve. The research natural area represents the really the sh the the near shore portion, the you know the, the shallow habitats that are going to ha serve as the nursery grounds, the 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 connection to the offshore, the deeper reefs that that the Tortugas Ecological Reserve makes up. It's it's just it was that critical piece of the puzzle to have full protection of the various marine habitats in the Tortugas. Anchoring over the coral reefs can cause damage by either the anchor itself or the rope or the chain hitting areas where coral is growing, causing them to break off. Anchors can also wreak havoc on sea grass beds, where an anchor can not only destroy the grass, but the substrate under the grass, causing long-term damage. While fishing and anchoring will no longer be permitted, snorkelers and divers may still enjoy the research natural area. Mooring buoys will be installed near popular dive sites to allow boats a place to tie up. Until these buoys are in place, though, boaters may continue to anchor on sand bottom only. In addition, small areas of the park will be marked off and closed to all entry to protect rare corals and nurse shark breeding grounds. Since Loggerhead Key is within the RNA, some of it has been closed to public entry. The central portion of the island, however, will remain open. Finally, a permit system will eventually be made effective for private boaters visiting the park. The permit will allow rangers to collect the park's $5 entrance fee to answer questions about the RNA and to advise boaters on navigating the park's waters. With the establishment of the RNA, about 46% of the park will be set off limits to recreational fishing. 54% of the park will remain open, including a one-mile nautical uh, mile radius around Garden Key, which is where Fort Jefferson is located. Part of the plan is to stop uh, recreational fishing, but also would be required that anchoring no longer occur in the research natural area, that you would be required to use a buoy system uh, and do uh, snorkeling and diving uh, from a buoy system. It's really a, it's a no fishing zone, not a no people zone. The decision to implement the research natural area was the result of scientific data but it also involved public comment. In 2000 and 2006, the park coordinated several public meetings, during which over 95% of written and verbal comments were supportive of the RNA. The RNA gives us the opportunity uh, to protect to a greater extent the resources within Dry Tortugas National Park. Uh, part of the mission of the National Park Service is to provide these areas for the enjoyment of the visitor, but we have to be careful not to provide that at the expense of the resource itself. 
With the newly established Tortugas Research Natural Area, the benefits should be noticeable inside its boundaries as well as outside its boundaries. Fish, which spend their youth in the Research Natural Area, may eventually move elsewhere, such as along the Florida Keys. The expectation is logical. Protect the source of new recruits, and ecosystems will be better off elsewhere. By protecting the spawning populations and the nursery grounds, that we will not only see larger fish in the, in the park and the, and the reserve, uh, but we'll see greater abundance and we'll see a greater abundance of, of larval fishes and these, these fish will move out of the sanctuary or be carried by currents and actually will benefit the fish populations all through the Keys and not just in the area of the park. But the results must be monitored and documented. The park will work in cooperation with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission to periodically review the effectiveness of the RNA. I'm a hydrologist by training and I think that having a, a science-based decision is really important and I think that's really what we were able to do out at Dry Tortugas when we really looked at the condition of the fishery. It was a science-based decision and we have a lot more science to do. While the research natural area is in its infancy, the National Park Service will emphasize public education about the RNA, what it is and why it was established. Eventually, the emphasis will shift to greater enforcement. The park will be making sure that the boundaries are marked on the nautical charts and we'll be developing handouts that show the boundaries of the RNA. Uh, but, it's the, but it's the boaters responsibility to know where they are. The Dry Tortugas Research Natural Area is now the largest fully protected marine area in the national park system and, with the Tortugas Ecological Reserve, the third largest coral reef protected area in the world. Combined, the two areas will constitute the largest no-take reserve in the continental United States. Times are changing in South Florida. As the population grows, Mother Nature faces unprecedented pressures. The Research Natural Area represents our dedication to protecting and restoring the environment, not just for its sake, but for our own. To view a map of the Research Natural Area, check the park's website at nps.gov slash drto. If you find yourself diving in the waters of China, Vietnam, Colombia, or even Ecuador, you may see a piece of Florida Keys ingenuity, mooring buoys. Over the past two and a half decades, the staff of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary has become a world-renowned expert in mooring buoy design and maintenance. Dropping an anchor in the Florida Keys can harm the living organisms on the sea floor. Before we had buoys, we had a lot of anchoring. And all it takes is one anchor down there. It could rip a coral head up, especially in rougher weather. In calmer weather, maybe not so much damage, but in rougher weather, we have a lot of problem with uh, breaking coral. All the, the branching corals or whatever are very delicate, and they're broken very easy. And then once you break that reef, then you have a lot of erosion. The ultimate problem with damaging the reef lies with the reef's inability to recover from anchor damage. The growth rate of hard corals, like star corals and brain corals, is approximately one centimeter a year. Therefore, if an anchor destroys a one meter round coral, it could be 100 years before that coral returns to its original size. The alternative to anchoring? Traditional mooring buoys, found in harbors everywhere, were created by connecting a chain to a big chunk of concrete. But this method would not suffice for the Florida Keys. With the occasional high winds and heavy seas of winter storms, or summer hurricanes, the concrete anchors were likely to move across the seafloor, damaging coral. In 1980, John Hallis began working for the Key Largo National Marine Sanctuary, and he got some ideas from some unlikely sources. He noticed the work of regional scientists taking core samples from the surrounding coral reefs. So in the early 80s, Hallis began his work on buoy design. The first installment was six buoys off of Key Largo. 
Although it was just the beginning of Hallis' experiments with the ultimate buoy, he was well on his way to perfecting it. Today, the number of buoys in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is more than 700. Some of the buoys are for mooring a boat. Some are simply to designate protected areas. We have spar buoys about four to six foot high, white pencil shaped buoys, and we have large yellow buoys denoting spa areas, sanctuary preservation areas, and we have white mooring balls, which a lot of people are familiar with, 18 inch buoys, white with a blue stripe on them. As boats using the reefs of the sanctuary have grown larger, sanctuary staff has responded by upgrading the mooring systems. Our mooring system is comprised of three parts a line and buoy and an anchoring system on the bottom on the ocean floor. Then we have a three-part system that runs up with inch and a quarter polypropylene line which has eye splices on either end. There is a down line with a subsurface float. There is a midsection that runs up to the buoy on the surface. The buoy has its own line and then there is a pickup or pennant that boaters will pick up on the surface. The Sanctuary Buoy Team is a highly qualified work diving team. They regularly use heavy equipment, like the jackhammers, which weigh about 90 pounds. The buoy team can find themselves five feet underwater, or 100 feet underwater. Many team members are Coast Guard certified boat captains. We go down there with hydraulic driven machinery, basically street jackhammers and street hammer drills and drill either into the dead coral rock or drive what's called a manta, it's galvanized steel, anchor with a spoon on it down about 10 foot into the sand. We lock these things in there. With the hammer drill, we install a stainless steel U-bolt that has two connections into the coral rock, which is cemented with hydraulic cement, dries approximately three to four weeks. Uh, in that case, then we will hang our lines and buoys onto that. The construction of the buoy system is only the beginning. The ocean is a hostile place. And even with 21st century technology, the life of a buoy is always limited. With a lot of care and attention from the sanctuary team, these buoys will be available for Keys boaters. What began with John Hallis and a handful of buoys off of Key Largo has grown to more than 700 buoys spread from Key Largo to the Tortugas. Each one of the buoys contributes to the health and preservation of the coral reef, a cornerstone of the Florida Keys tourism-based economy. 700 buoys is a lot. Is it enough? Will there eventually be dozens of buoys on every reef, everywhere? Uh, how it basically starts is we have uh, a dive shop or somebody from the public comes to us and asks us for a, a buoy at a particular site. Sometimes it's their favorite reef. And then generally what we do is we go to different dive shops and we ask them, would you like to have a buoy at this reef? So we try to get a consensus. We don't want to put a buoy on every reef that every individual wants because otherwise we'd be putting buoys everywhere. As Steve Baumgartner explains, not every location requested is suitable for a buoy. There are some places that are too prone to damage. Mooring buoys work best to bring relief from repeated anchor damage at reefs that already are heavily visited. Installing a mooring on a little-known reef has the potential to drastically increase visitation and the impacts that result from repeated use. In such a case, it may be able to work with those who do use the site to encourage proper anchoring. At a busy reef, installing only one or two buoys may concentrate use around those areas. The sanctuary must strive to achieve the proper balance. We find that if we put one buoy on one important reef, because everybody's going to be using that buoy constantly, that's why we like to put numerous buoys out there so we kind of spread the wealth out a little bit more. By rotating the surface moorings, the sanctuary is testing a new management technique that may reduce the impact of repeated use on these sites. The idea draws from a technique long used on land, where park managers will close down trails temporarily to allow them to recover. So now you know what it takes to keep the mooring balls ready for you to use. 
but every voter plays a role in ensuring the moorings remain in good condition for fulfilling their purpose of protecting the reef. There are problems with some boaters that don't really know how to hook up to our moorings. It looks like you would just come up and pick our yellow pickup line out of the water and just put it right on the cleat of your boat. But that's not the proper way to do it. And we just ask everybody to use their own line that runs from their cleat through the eye splice in our pickup line back to their boat. Uh, that provides more scope for these moorings, makes everything safer, makes it work better and uh, it's very easy for recreational commercial boaters just to drop their line and slip away when it's time to go. The best way to approach a mooring buoy is to approach the buoy from the downwind side and the down current side. This way, the pickup line will be accessible. Have a line ready with one end tied to a bow cleat on your vessel. Use a boat hook to retrieve the pickup line. Now pass the loose or bitter end of your line through the eye of the mooring buoy pickup line and tie it off to a bow cleat, creating a bridle. For safety purposes, check to make sure the water depth at the buoy you select will allow your boat to remain clear of the reef. Remember to account for tidal changes. The presence of a mooring ball does not guarantee the area is deep enough for all vessels. Remember never to cut across the reef. Instead, traveling around it to reach the mooring field. The offshore reefs in the Keys are busy places. Head slowly to your chosen mooring. Watch carefully for divers and snorkelers. If you have any questions, pick up a brochure that describes the proper steps in tying to a mooring ball. The brochures are available at marine and tourist-related businesses throughout the Florida Keys and online at floridakeys.noaa.gov. The success of the mooring buoy system in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary has inspired many other countries to adopt the same system. Grand Cayman in 1986, and soon after, Little Cayman Island. The numbers exploded from there, bringing John Hallis and other members of the sanctuary's mooring buoy team to all corners of the globe. People ask me, well, how many countries? And uh, you know, there's some countries like the Bahamas that there's, you know, four islands or so within that. So I say countries slash regions, uh, it's, it has to be well over 50 now that, uh, that I'm aware of. The job of maintaining 700 buoys in the Florida Keys and the Tortugas is an enormous and sometimes monotonous job. But the team knows that they are on the cutting edge of the industry, an industry that is expanding as people's consciousness evolves and the desire to protect such a beautiful and delicate resource increases.